Hey, Dr. J. We made it to chapter four today. We're going to start with uh, 4.1, uh, visualizing fractions. Just a little fun fact. Um, if you're into these kind of things, a uh, fraction comes from the Latin the Latin word fractio, which means to break. Um, that's why if you've ever broken your arm, uh, it's called a fracture. Yeah, you broke your arm, you fractured your arm. Um, fractio, fractions, to break. So um, in this section, we're going to do a lot of visual uh, math, um, talking about you know what the fractions mean when we look at them in terms of objects. Um, so to get a good idea about what that means, we'll start with a very basic example. What fraction is represented by the shaded area? So we're really going back to old school here. Now, Latin, Italy, Italy, pizza. Yeah. So suppose I have a pizza cut into eight slices and I'm going to shade three of the eight slices. I know it takes me forever to do this, but there you go. So we have a fraction. The top of the fraction is called the numerator. Sometimes if I'm being lazy, I'll just call that the top. But the fancy way to say it is numerator. And the bottom is called the denominator. And again, sometimes I'll be lazy and I'll just call that the bottom. And then this bar here is sometimes called a fraction bar. It actually means division. We'll get to that in a minute when we're actually going to divide it. So the numerator is the number of shaded pieces. I want to think of this as a pizza. It doesn't have to be a pizza, but it is Italian. Yeah. Uh, the denominator is the total number of pieces. So we have three shaded pieces, and we have a total number of pieces of eight. So the fraction is three-eighths. Three-eighths. Some people will say three over eight. Uh, that, that's okay. It's acceptable, but... Um, it's a fraction, it's 3 eighths. Uh, same question. I don't want to write it all out again. Just a different shape. So what fraction is represented by the shaded area? So we have four shaded regions, and we have a total of nine squares. I guess this is 
Sicilian style pizza. Yeah, the square, rectangular style of pizza. <laughs> Maybe I'm a little hungry. I don't know. Okay, so that's the idea behind visualizing fractions. Uh, this type of fraction, they're called proper fractions. A proper fraction is less than one. So a proper fraction represents a quantity that is less than a whole. Call that a proper fraction. So here's the fancy definition. A proper fraction is A over B. I don't need, here, I'll call this definition instead. So the definition of a proper fraction is A over B, or A over B, where A is less than B. If A is equal to B, then it is called a whole or a unit fraction. So for example, if I took my pizza and I shaded all of the pieces, I don't know about you, but this is how I cut. Um, if you ever buy a frozen pizza, this is how I cut it. I just cut it in fourths. Yeah. So this would be four fourths. This is called a unit fraction. It equals one whole. Yeah. So that would be if the numerator and the denominator, that's A and B, if they were equal to each other, we would call that a unit fraction or a whole. A whole unit. In other words, I've shaded the whole pie. Yeah, the whole pizza. There are lots of different ways to do unit fractions. I, I did four fourths. Uh, you can also do, you know, six six. I don't want to redraw it, but you could do six six. Three thirds. Again, I'd have to shade all of it. So on and so forth. It takes me a while to shade it. Bear with me. Do I have to shade it perfectly? I don't think I do. So that would be six sixths. And at this point, I think you get the idea. Anytime you have the numerator and the denominator equal to each other, we call that a unit fraction or a whole. What fraction is represented by... following. So I've got two holes, two unit fractions, and then I'm going to shade one piece of this one. So, um, I've got three thirds, that's this one, it's one whole, plus another three thirds, plus one third. So, all together, I have seven thirds. Okay. 
This is called an improper fraction. So an improper fraction is A over B, where A is greater than B. So the numerator is greater than B. We call that an improper fraction. Now, let me just make this very clear. I mean, my answer here is 7 thirds, but I want to make it very clear. The numerator is the total number of shaded regions Now here's the weird part. I don't know if it's weird, but it's, you just have to be careful with it. The denominator is the number of regions or pieces. I spell pieces right? P-E-I, P-I-E, I don't know. It's one of those, there it is, P-I-E. The number of regions, also known as pieces, in one whole. or in one unit. So the denominator does not get added up. I don't want anybody out there to go 3 plus 3 plus 3 and then make the denominator 9. All right. The denominator stays 3 because these fractions, each one of these pi, pizza pie, whatever you want to call them, each one of them has three slices or pieces, also known as a slice. Region, area, piece, slice, those are all words that mean the same thing. Okay. Let's try it out. Five is really hard to do. Let's see if I can do five. Ah. I'll do six instead. <laughs> the computer can do five pretty good, but it's really hard for a person to cut. Try, try it next time. Get a pizza. Go, go buy a frozen pizza and try to cut it into five perfect slices. It's very difficult. I can do three. I can do four. Six is pretty easy, yeah? Just three on top, if you think of that as the top, and three on the bottom. All right, so I'm going to shade these completely. If you're getting bored, you can fast forward to when I'm done shading here because I don't really have anything to say, except I'm going to eat all of these pizzas. All except one slice. Okay. So what do we got here? The total number of shaded regions. So I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So that's 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That's 18. 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. That's the total number of shaded regions. 23. And then... How many are in one? 23 sixths. 
And that's the answer. 23 sixths. It's an improper fraction. You could also do it this way. 6 sixths. Another 6 sixths. So these are all unit fractions. They're whole pizzas. And then this one is 5 sixths. If you do it this way, just make sure that you don't accidentally add up the denominators. Just add up the numerators, and you're still going to get the same result, which is 23 sixths. A mixed number is C, A over B, where C is the number of holes or unit. And AB is a proper fraction. All right. So to write this as a mixed number, you count one whole two holes, three holes. So all together we have three holes. That's our C, three whole pizzas. Yeah. And then our A over B is the proper fraction, the one that's not a whole pie. So that would be 5 sixths. And so we say 3 and 5 sixths. There's an invisible and there. 3 and 5 sixths. And then we just write our answer like this. 3 and 5 sixths. 3 holes and 5 sixths of a not whole or a proper fraction. I don't really think I need to draw the pictures for a little while, so let's go ahead and put the, the pictures on hold. You can just imagine a pizza or imagine a, you know, something being cut up into little pieces, being broken, frac fractured into pieces. Um, if it becomes necessary, maybe we'll go back to drawing these again. Um, for now, I'm going to move away from the, um, the, the visual, and I'm going to go to the mechanical or the arithmetic. I'm going to solve, calculate, evaluate, things like that uh, using arithmetic instead of actually you know, drawing a picture every time. So notice um, in example three, was this example three? I think so. Uh, there were Where's example four? One, two, three, four. Example four. There were two answers. Yeah. The improper. was 23 6 and the mixed number was 3 and 5 6 and so next we are going to learn to convert back and forth from 23 6 into 3 and 5 6 
or vice versa, convert from 3 and 5 sixths back into 23 sixths. And we're going to do it without drawing the diagram. So here's the technique, OK? To go from improper to mixed, use long division. Okay, calculators do not work. Some of you found that out the hard way back in chapters one and two. If you use the calculator, I, had, I hate to say I told you so, but I told you so, the calculator will give you a decimal and you will not have the right mixed number. It just, it won't ever be right, okay? You just gotta do it the long way. It's the whole reason why we still keep this alive. You might have wondered why after we invented calculators do we still have this? It's because calculators don't do everything. There are, they, there are things that they cannot do. It's sort of intentional. That, that <laughs> I'm sure we could make a calculator that does this, but intentionally we don't do that. We make you keep this alive. All right? Otherwise your brain is just going to turn to mush. All right. Six goes into 23 five times. Five times six is third. Oh, five times. God, my brain is mush. Three times. Six goes into 23 three times. I'm actually kind of glad I screwed up because if you put five, you're going to see it's too big. Um, in fact, four is too big as well. Three times six is 18. The remainder is five. And so it's C, A, B in the following order. This is always B, this is A, and this is C. Got to make sure you know which one's which. All right, put them in the right order. So it's C, that's 3, and 5, that's A, and then 6. And technically, there's an and in between there. We say three and five, six, but we typically don't write the word. OK, so that's how you go from improper into mixed. To go from mixed. Uh, to improper, now I'm intentionally using the same problem since we already know what we should get, right? We better get 23 over 6, otherwise we did something wrong. First thing you do is rewrite it as and. And means plus. Three plus five sixths. Uh, oftentimes we skip. This, I said that earlier. You don't actually have to write the word and, but I in this um, presentation I'm writing it so that you know that and means plus. So this means three plus five sixths. Now here's the weird part. Then you multiply three times six. That gives you eighteen sixths. And then you add only the tops. And typically, we only write the denominator one time. So this is a 6. This is a 6. You're only going to write the denominator one time. And there you go.
All right, um, the quick way to do it is to go like this. Six times three plus five. So six times three plus five over six, 18 plus five over six, 23 over six. I've really beat that one up. Um, you've seen it a lot of different ways now. Okay. Normally in practice, when you're just you know doing your problems and your homework or whatever, we do it the quick way. This long sort of drawn out way, this is the algebraic way. You see, I'm trying to train you into how to solve or how to evaluate in this case, um, an expression using an algebraic system. Yeah. Eventually these will be variables, you know, X and Y and Z and things like that. So I really like to plant that um, concept in your mind now. Okay, um, so now that you've seen the two different ways, I think I'm up to example five. You know, I might be off by one, but it's okay. I do have a, a pen shortage going on in my house right now. So convert uh, into a mixed number. Fourteen thirds. Come on back to me. What am I going to do? Have a drink. time do I waste with this stupid thing? I swear I've turned off the autofocus. I turned it off, but it just keeps coming back on. I don't know why. There we go. Um, if you're really good at mental math, yeah, you're really good at mental math, you already know the answer, right? It's four and two thirds. Yeah, you already know it. Three goes into 14 four times with a remainder of two. So you, you can mentally know that this is already going to be four and two thirds. I'm going to show you the way to do it in case you don't have the instant mind, you know, just boom. Some, some people have that. It just pops into their head immediately. Three goes into 14 four times. Four times three is 12. Remainder is two. And so this is equal to four and two thirds. Four and two thirds. All right. C A B. C A B. You could do your own version, A B C, if you really like it alphabetical. I like C A B. All right. C stands for constant, whole, whole number constant. A B stands for the fraction A B. Uh, with a negative number, with a negative number, ignore the negative. But don't forget to go back and pick it up. Sometimes when I tell students to ignore something, they just ignore it and then they, and I'm the same way, and I just kind of never go back and pick it up again. But you do not want to put that negative sign into this procedure. It screws up the value. 
So you want to just use your long division. 5 goes into 33 six times. 6 times 5 is 30. Remainder 3. And so you have 6 and 3 fifths. Don't forget to go back and get it. And just put your negative right in front of the whole number. So it's negative 6 and 3 fifths. All right. Um, so that's converting from an improper into a mix. Now let's go the other way. Seven eighths. So let's go ahead and do it the quick way. You're going to multiply and then add, and you're going to keep the same denominator. So I like to just put the denominator down now, keep it the same. Two times eight is sixteen. 16 plus 7 is 23, so that's 23 eighths. Um, oftentimes, students will do this in their head. As long as the numbers are reasonable and manageable, if you can hold them in your head, you can just go bam, 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 and then just jump right over here, 23 eighths. Uh, with negatives, say uh, negative 5 and 3 fourths. Again, ignore, but don't forget to go back and pick it up. So what do we got? We got uh, five, oh, keep the denominator the same. 5 times 4 is 20. Oh, my God, 23 again. <laughs> We're seeing a lot of 23s today, huh? And then don't forget to go back and put the negative in front of your result. It's very important that you ignore it because if you go 5, excuse me, if you go 4 times negative 5, if you include the negative, you're going to get negative 20, and then it's going to screw everything all up. Let's try another one. Well, let's do it. <laughs> that one's good. All right, so ignore this. Let's try this all in our head. All right, keep the denominator the same. Denominator's 9. Uh, 9 times 2, remember ignoring the negative. 9 times 2 is 18. 18 plus 1 is 19. So this is 19 ninths, and then put the negative back in front. Okay. I'll make a note. Um, the negative sign goes in front or on top. So if you prefer, when you're typing your answer, you can type it like this, and this would also be correct. Technically, you may put the negative in the bottom, in the denominator, this is still correct, 
but it's dangerous. Yeah, so if you like to live dangerously, you like to take risks, go ahead, you can do that. I, I won't mark it wrong. But what will happen is if, if you like this danger and you keep doing it, eventually it's gonna get you. <laughs> You know, it's legal, but eventually it'll get you. When we start solving more complicated problems, if you are in the habit of putting your negatives in the bottom, it, even though it's legal, it's okay. So my recommendation one of these two. That's the doctor recommendation. Either put the negative out in front, kind of equal with the fraction bar, or put it up on top. Yeah. And try to avoid this if possible, yeah. unless you really want to push the envelope, you know, say, oh, I'm going to do it all the way up until I know that it's going to get me in trouble and then I'll stop doing it. You could certainly do that. Yeah. As long as you know when to quit, that's the main idea. Okay, so um, that's kind of the idea behind, behind all of this. Um, let's draw some more pictures, I guess. Next, we're going to talk about equivalent fractions. So I'm going to go back to my pizza factory here. So suppose I shade half the circle. Yeah. That would be one half. But what if I do this? What if I shade two slices out of four? These are equivalent. These have the same meaning. These are equivalent fractions. One half is equal. <laughs> I know we don't normally draw equal signs like that, but these are equivalent. These have the same meaning. You could also do something like this. I could shade three out of six. And that's still equal to one half. And since I have room, I might as well do one more. I could shade four out of eight. And all of these fractions are all equivalent to one half. Okay. So what am I getting at here? Um, because I'm obviously going to do this process with numbers other than one half, and I'm not going to draw these pictures every single time I do it. Okay. So to get from this fraction to this fraction, all I did was add in another slice. Yeah. I just cut my pizza into another slice. Each time you multiply, you are producing another slice. That's what's called, that's why it's called multiplication, right? So, you know, you buy a pizza and you've only got two people that have to share it. You only have to cut it into two big slices, although those would be some funny looking pizza slices. But if all of a sudden I've got four people that are gonna share this pizza, now I've gotta cut it into four slices. And so I multiply the numerator and the denominator by the same number. The easiest one to do is two. Yeah. And if you multiply by two, you have to do the numerator and the denominator. Then you get one times two is two, two times two is four, and now you've got a pizza with four slices. 
You want to get a pizza with six slices? Start with one half. Instead of multiplying by two, multiply by three, and you will get three sixths. Yeah, one times three is three, two times three is six. Well, now you've made enough slices, you've cut it into six slices. I'm still only eating half the pizza, by the way. I'm trying to save half of it. Yeah. Here, you take the same half, multiply it by four. Yeah. One times four is four, two times four is eight, and now you've taken the same half of a pizza. I'm still only eating half of it, but now I've cut it into four slices. That would be four eighths. So you can make any fraction equivalent to another fraction by multiplying the numerator and the denominator by the same number. And visually, in the, you know, the real world, what that essentially means is you've just cut another slice. All right, so write any fraction, any fraction that's equivalent to, and I'll give you, I gave you two, two examples here, one third and eight fifths. If I say any, then you pick the number to multiply by. If you're lazy, just pick two. That will always be, you have to pick a number bigger than two, or greater than or equal to two. All right, so don't pick one, because if you pick one, it's not gonna give you the, a different fraction. So if you're lazy, just pick two. It's the easiest one. You get two sixths, and there you go, any fraction. All right, if you wanna work a little harder, try a bigger number than two. Try three or try four doesn't really matter. As long as you do the same number on the top and the bottom, when I say any, I will accept any answer that's correct. So you can pick any number greater than or equal to two. I probably should have said at least two. You don't have to use two, but you have to use a number that's at least two. Two, three, four, five, six. Now, I might say any. I'm sure I will at least once. I'll say find any fraction. And that just means I'm, I'm just throwing it out there. I'm just, oh, there's a million different correct answers. Um, but I have to be a little bit more precise. Right? I'm not just going to allow a million you know, different correct answers. So I might specify find a fraction that is equivalent to three fourths. with a denominator of 20. So now I'm not saying any old fraction, I'm being very specific. So this is not just any, this is very specific. I want a specific fraction. So 3 fourths equals 
denominator is 20, and you have to figure out what the top is. So what you really are trying to do is you're trying to figure out what did I multiply or what must I multiply by to get 20? What does it have to be? 4 times what gives you 20? Well, that has to be 5. Yeah. If you can't just think of the number, then you actually have to divide. 20 divided by 4 is 5. I typically don't do it that way. I just look at it, and I know there's only one key, one number that will actually make 20 down here. Once you've done that, then 3 times 5, it has to be 5, so the numerator must be 15. So the answer is 15 twentieths. That's your answer. I don't know why I wrote it twice. I just, this is kind of like my scratch work over here, and then that's my actual answer. So this is more likely. This is more likely. I mean, I'm going to give you both types, but this is the one that I really want to hit home, is that I'm going to specify something about the fraction that thereby forces you to do it the way I want it to. So I got 1 fourth equals blank. This time I'm specifying the numerator. The numerator is specified to be 16. And then the denominator is what? I don't know. So again, just ask yourself, what? What does it have to be multiplied by 1 to give you 16? Well, it has to be 16. So what is that magic number? It's 16, right? It's 16 divided by 1 is 16. And then now multiply 4 times 16. That gives you 64. So the answer, 16, 64. This fraction is equivalent to 1 fourth. Whenever the numerator is 1, you know that it's just going to be exactly whatever that number is, right? Because it's 1 times 16 is equal to 16. Find a fraction that's equivalent to 9 fifths with a denominator of 30. So 9 fifths, denominator is 30. Make sure you read it very carefully. I would say the most common mistake with these basic arithmetic problems, it has nothing to do with math. It's just, you know, you didn't read it carefully, you just kind of skimmed over it too quickly and, and blew it on the the reading part, so read it carefully. So what times 5 is going to be 30? Yeah, and if you have to, do mental math. You know, 30 divided by 5 is 6. So you know that this must be 6. This is the what. When I say what. I already know 5, I already know 30. The what was the 6 that I wasn't sure what it was. Okay. 
So I'm multiplying numerator and denominator. Make sure you do both. And then 9 times 6 is 54. And so that's your answer. This time I'm just going to write the answer once. 54 thirtieths. Uh, we could do this with negative numbers, yeah. although you probably know what I'm about to say. You're going to ignore the negative. Find a fraction that is equivalent to negative 8 with a numerator, sorry, oh, yeah, I can do this, with a numerator of negative 72. So you're just going to put the negative off to the side. Yeah, or you could put it right in front of the 8 here, but you're going to ignore it. The numerator has to be negative 72. Right. And so now you're asking yourself, what times 8 is equal to 72? And then you have to remember that there's an invisible... 1 in the denominator. So anytime you have an integer or a whole number, natural number, there's always an invisible 1 in the denominator. That's very important because when you do the what, right, you're going to have to do the top and the bottom. So, what times 8 is 72? You can just ignore the negative. Just think of this as 8. Think of that as 72. What times 8 is 72? 9 times 8 is 72. So the denominator is 9. And so that's your answer. Basically, all of the techniques about involving fractions, if we have negative numbers, we don't change the technique. We just ignore the negative. We do the same technique we would do with a positive, and then we put the negative back when we're done. All right, last one of these, and we'll move on to something else. Find a fraction that's equivalent to 6 with the denominator of 42. Denominator of 42. Remember, there's an invisible 1 down here. And I recommend writing the 1. If you don't write the 1, you might put the 6 down too low, and you might go 6 goes into 42. So what, that's your what, times 1 is equal to 42? Well, that's just 42. So now you got to do 6 times 42. That's going to be 252. I just did that in my head, so I should probably check. 
Um, 6 times 42, 6 times 2 is 12, carry the 1. 6 times 4 is 24, plus 1 is 252. That's correct. All right. The more you do that, the better off you're going to be in, in your mathematical and probably all of your education because, you know, you want to really be, you know, pushing your mental envelope, you know, and then, and then check and make sure it's right, you know. The more you do that, the more confident you're going to get. I just want to make a real quick comment on this one and almost like a confessional comment. I have actually screwed this problem up in the past. Um, you know, maybe in lecture, maybe maybe even when I was a student, um, you know, with helping my kids or helping students in office hours, because my brain kind of reads this upside down sometimes, right? I don't, I don't know if it's dyslexia or it's just laziness or something like this, but I want to make something very clear. Compare this with one-sixth. That's why it's very important that you write 6 over 1. All right. Sometimes a problem will be phrased almost the same, but some slight variation causes the result to be totally different. So this time I want 1 6 with a denominator of 42. So notice now the one is in the numerator. So when I do my what, when I look for my unknown value, it's not going to be 42 anymore. It's going to be what times 6 is 42, and then that would in fact be 7. So, you know, that's my confession that I have taken the problem we just did and then accidentally put 7. If the given value is 1 6, well then 7 is correct. If the given value is 6, well then 7 is not correct. So in this example, it would be 7 over 42. All right, so be careful. Sometimes your mind has a mind of its own. <laughs> it's almost like your mind is doing what it wants to do, even though you're like trying to steer the ship, you know, and the mind is just sort of going on autopilot. So I don't know about you, but I, I have the same problem. Um, and then a couple other comments. Um, invisible ones. Yeah, so if I say um, simplify, uh, I don't know, 9 over 1, yeah, this 1 is really invisible, yeah. So this literally means 9 divided by 1. That's what that means. And so that 1 is invisible, and the final result is just 9. Also, if I asked you to simplify 9 over 9, that's different than 9 over 1. That's 9 over 9. And again, here's the cloud. This just means 9 divided by 9. And that is, in fact, 1. And it's not invisible. You can clearly see that that's a 1. So this is an invisible 1, <laughs> and then this is a not invisible 1. Notice how I write it when I don't want it to be invisible. <laughs> it's okay if you don't want to write your 1s like me. You certainly can just write them like that as well. I've got my own you know, pet ways of writing things, and I've just been doing it for so long. That's just the way it is now. Okay. Opposites. If 
find the opposite. There it goes again. You're fired. No. <laughs> That's not funny anymore, is it? All right. Um, well, while we're sitting here waiting for my camera to focus, there we go. Find the opposite. I just kind of threw this in there for variety uh, because I'm, I don't know if you've noticed, you know, hopefully you have, I'm a big fan of vocabulary. It's in fact, probably if not just as important as math, um, it certainly drives the, the engine, right? It's like the, it, without the vocabulary, it's like the gas, right? It, it, it fuels the engine, that's a better way to say it. Vocabulary is the fuel and the engine is the mathematics, right? And so without the vocabulary, the engine's not gonna run. You're gonna run out of gas. Opposite does not mean flip, okay? Opposite means put a negative out in front. So this is the opposite of negative 9 fifths. So it just becomes 9 fifths. You can do this with mental math and just go right from, I don't know why I wrote five. Somebody almost got extra credit out there. That was close. That's a two, not a five. So the opposite of nine halves is negative, negative nine halves, which is just nine halves. And same thing here. The opposite of two thirds is negative two thirds, which is just negative two thirds. Or I would also accept negative two over three. Either one of these is fine. All right. The main thing, don't flip it. Sometimes people see opposite and they think, oh, let's flip it upside down. That's the opposite, right? It's kind of, that's something else that we'll talk about in, in the next lecture. Okay, um, wow, this is a long introduction to chapter four, huh? But I gotta do it, we're gonna get it done here. The next thing we're gonna do is do the number line and, and then we'll just kind of ride that out till the end. So first thing I wanna point out is that proper fractions, proper fractions live between zero and one. Improper fractions live past one. Unit fractions are exactly equal to one. There's my fancy one. On the negative side, you have the opposite unit. Negative one. You have the opposite propers. Those are between zero and negative one. And then you have the opposite impropers. Those are less than negative one or farther to the left of negative one. So there are six different categories. You have opposite improper, opposite unit, opposite proper. You of course have zero. 
I don't know if that's even worth categorizing. Everybody knows what zero is. You have proper, proper between zero and one, and then you have improper between one and infinity. And this goes off forever and ever. I'm sort of losing count. We're so far down the road now, but oh, it's OK. It doesn't really matter. Um, identify A and B use a fraction or a mixed number. Oh, by the way, mixed numbers are typically here. Mixed and impropers are the same thing. So these would be negative mixed, also known as opposite mixed, and then these would just be ordinary mixed. Um, I'm actually going to start off by just being on this side of the number line. So we'll have a number line like this, and we're only going to look at the positive side of the number line. So we'll, we'll look over here later. So identify A and B, use fractions or mixed numbers. I, when I say fraction, it could be proper or it could be improper. It just depends on where it is. Yeah. So A will be proper because A is between 0 and 1. B will either be improper or mixed. It, it's really up to you or up to the instructions. It doesn't really specify. It gives me the option. So the or option, I can choose, you know, which way I want to write it. Now, here's the most important thing about the number line. Count the spaces between 0 and 1 not the ticks or the tick marks. All right. Do not count the tick marks. If you count the tick marks, you're going to get it wrong. You want to count the spaces. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Count the spaces between 0 and 1. This is the denominator. All right. Then count the spaces up to the letter. This is the numerator. OK, so I've got 8. That's my denominator. And then 1, 2, 3, up to the number, the, num uh, the letter. The letter will be right on one of the tick marks. I mean, I guess you could count the tick marks, but some people will accidentally count the very first tick mark. So again, count the spaces, one, two, three. And so that's three. 
And so that means A is 3 eighths. That's the value for A. OK. Uh, for B, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So count all of the spaces. Make sure you count all of them. Some people will accidentally start over again at 1. You don't want to start over again. So it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So that's 9. And then the denominator is still 8. So you get 9 eighths. Um, the fraction is 3 eighths. That's a proper fraction. The mixed number, if you choose, would be 1 and 1 eighth. It's the same as 9 eighths. All right, so that's what the or means. You do have a choice. You can write fraction, yeah, proper or improper. This is improper. 9 eighths, or you can write it as mixed. 1 and 1 eighth. Um, so that's the really well defined way of doing it. Let's just go ahead and do one from our memory now. Uh, identify A and B. Give your answers as proper or improper fractions. So this time I'm not giving you the option of mixed. Again, we're starting at zero. Look about equal. Give my unequal measures here. Okay, so we got A, B. All right, so let's count the spaces. One, two, three, four, five, six. So that's going to be our denominator. Uh, A is seven, let's see, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 is B. So A is seven sixths, and B is 13 sixths. Neither one of them are proper because none of them are between 0 and 1. So they're both improper. I really should be putting like dots on the line to indicate the letter. If there's any ambiguity, just go to whichever tick mark is closest to the letter. Um, when we really get into the specifics of graphing, I will have to start using dots and lines and things like that. But right now, I'm just kind of waving my hands in the air and doing it that way. All right, I will make a note. If mixed numbers were allowed, make sure you read carefully. 
then the answers would be, what would that be? One and one sixth. That would be seven sixth. And then B would be two and one sixth. Yeah. If the mixed numbers were allowed. It's a long one. Now we got to do the negatives. Well, that's good the camera is uh, not behaving right now so let's give, give me time to do this that's a negative one I tell you these videos would be a little bit shorter if the camera didn't keep screwing up on me Okay, um, so where are we at here? Uh, we're going to be at uh, A and B. All right, with negatives, you basically just ignore the negative, do the problem like you would normally do it, just like as if it were positive, and then put the negative back when you're done. All right, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So that's my denominator. Uh, there's no specific instructions on how to write it, so I'm just going to write them however I like. Okay, um, and so I've got one, two, three. Count the spaces up to B, so that'll be three tenths for B. And then all the way up to A, 9 tenths. And again, A is above the tick mark here. So you count the one before it. Yeah, so 9 tenths. And there you go. Oh, what did I forget? Don't forget your negative sign. You can either put it on top or you can put it out in front. Either way. There you go. I'm going to put this to rest for a little bit um, in terms of drawing the fractions on the line, but I, I'm going to now try to put them in order using inequalities, less than and greater than and things like that. Um, for today, we're just going to do these two symbols, the less than and the greater than symbol. We're not going to use the less than or equal to or the greater than or equal to today. So we're just going to use these two. Recall, we say A is less than B if uh, A is to the left. of B and then we say A is greater than B if A is to the right of B. Again, this is your mind remembering the rules. That's your recollection bubbles there. Okay. So to compare fractions, they must have the same denominator. Yeah, 
decimals. For example, 5 twelfths and 7 twelfths, if they have the same denominator, I can clearly say that 5 twelfths is less than 7 twelfths. How about this? Four thirds and two thirds. I can clearly say that four thirds is greater than two thirds. Because four thirds lies to the right of two thirds. And by the way, when I say left and right, I'm saying on the line, on the number line. Yeah. That's what I mean when I say left and right. I don't mean left and right on paper. I might write them backwards and I'm saying left, but I mean right because I'm talking about where they live on the number line. Okay, so in the next example, we are going to insert the inequality symbol in the proper order. Sorry, I wrote down the wrong one. And so when I say insert, there'll be like a little box here that you can insert the symbol into to determine which one is greater and which one is less. This might be example 19, but I'm just, we've gone on for so long, I've lost track of where we're at. Okay. All right. Um, now, don't worry about... Um, anything other than making the denominators the same. So you must make these the same. So you can do this all with mental math. How many times does three go into six? It goes in two times. Okay, so now this becomes two, and this becomes six. So this is two sixths, this is three sixths, Three sixths lies to the right of two sixths. Um, just mentally, uh, three sixths, and we'll do this in the next section. We kind of already did it. Just a little mental math note uh, three sixths means the same thing as one half. So one half is greater than one third kind of regretting not having just done that in the first place, but whatever, as long as I set it at one point. Okay. Now nine and 12, this one's a little tougher. All right. Nine and 12, you're gonna have to multiply this one by eight. Yeah, that'll make it 72. And then you're gonna have to multiply this one by six. That's a tough one. I like to rewrite the whole problem when they get this messy. So you get negative 30 over 72. That's the one on the left. And then there's a blank. And then you got negative 16 over 72. All right. And the one that lies to the right 
is negative 16 over 72. In other words, on the number line, this is right and this is left. If you were to draw them on the line that I've been doing in the last couple examples. All right, for this one, you want to make them the same, 15 and 6. By the way, this is just LCM, by the way. Least common multiple, yeah, we talked about that in previous chapters. So when I do this, I'm doing the least common multiple. Um, in fractions, it's called an LCD. It means the same thing as LCM. So 15 and 6, I want to make it 30. Yeah, that would be the LCM, 30. So in order to make this one 30, I have to multiply by 2. And in order to make this one 30, I have to multiply by 5. So now I've got 12 30ths. And 25 30ths. And this one is greater, 25 30ths. I didn't plan that. I just, I randomly picked these three problems, um, you know, out of the homework. And they all ended up going the same direction. I guess you could kind of game it on the homework if you really want. You could just guess one thing. And if it's not right, then it's clearly going to go the other way. Um, it, there's no penalty for that in the homework and there's no penalty for that on the lab, but on the quiz or the test, you only get one chance. So you have to get it right the first time that you can't just guess. <coughs> I'm getting tired and we're running out of time. Um, I've already gone longer than I intended on going. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and put this to rest and I'll just let you guys play around with that. Uh, we'll talk more about inequalities as time goes on. The last couple things I want to do is ordering uh, write the numbers in order we call this ascending from least to greatest We call it ascending order, from the smallest to the largest. Okay. If you like, it's not a bad idea to be imagining a number line. If I would have had more room on the last question, I probably would have done that myself. Zero is in the middle. One, negative one. All right. And let's just go from least to greatest. So negative five halves. That's going to be over here somewhere. I don't really care where, that's why it's in a cloud. I just care that it's improper. And opposite, yeah, negative improper. All right. Then I've got negative one, that one goes right here. That's easy. Then I've got zero, that one goes there. Then I've got one, that one goes here. All right. What did I miss? Negative two fifths. That's proper negative. So that one goes in between here. Negative two fifths. That's proper and negative. And then finally, I've got my positive proper. That's right here. Positive two fifths. And then I've got my positive improper. That's over here, five halves. 
So in the answer box, just type them in order from least to greatest. We got time for one more. Barely. You could also say from smallest to largest. Lots of different ways to say it. This should be a little bit easier um, because they're all positive and proper. And so that means that on your number line, they all live between 0 and 1. Yeah. So I'm not even going to bother drawing the number line. Then. I mean, if everybody's between 0 and 1, I mean, if you're imagining a number line, there's 0, there's 1, everybody lies in between 0 and 1. I said I wasn't going to do it, and I did it anyway. I'm not going to do the whole problem on the number line. In this case, just make all the denominators the same. Yeah, this is called an LCD, least common denominator. All right, so what is the smallest number that all of these numbers go into? It's 100. Yeah, smallest number they all go into is 100. So you're going to think to yourself, what do I need to multiply by to make an equivalent fraction with a denominator of 100? So this one will be 10. I'll make that 100. This one will be 5. I'll make that 100. This one will be 20. Make sure you do the top and the bottom, numerator and denominator. That'll make that one 100. And this one will be 4. So now I've got 30 over 100, 15 over 100. 40 over 100, and 24 over 100. Now be careful, because you're going to put them in order, but then you want to remember which one was which. Okay? So when we're done, we want to go back to these numbers, what they originally were. So that's why I'm not erasing any of this stuff. So now let's put them in order. Okay? Um, if you like, you can label them A, B, C, D, little memory labels, so you can keep track of them. So smallest is B, yeah, 15 over 100. That's the smallest. Here. I don't need any of that stuff. Smallest, 15 over 100. So that's B. Cross that off. The next one, D, 24 over 100. That's D. Cross that one off. Then 30 over 100. That's A. Cross that one off. And then finally, 40 over 100. That's C. Now I'm glad I kept all my old work here. So B, B is this one. So my final answer, 3 over 20, that one goes first. 
Yeah, that's B. Then D. D was 6 over 25. Then A, A is over here, 3 tenths. And then C, C is here, 2 fifths. If you want to be glad of a couple things, or appreciate a couple things, number one is we're done. So whew, you made it. Uh, this will probably be one of the longer lectures in chapter four because it's the introductory lecture. Um, and then the second thing is when I do these problems, these really complicated ones, I usually don't include the negatives because that just makes it even, uh, you know, doubly is complicated. Um, but having said that, um, we are now, you know, introduced. Consider yourself introduced into Chapter 4. Um, I'll continue with this um, topic again next time. But until then, um, this is Dr. Jordan. And I'll see you on the internet.